Is this the moment that CNN are confronted with their own mainstream media biases? Continually we talk on this channel about the nature of information and the problems with the media institutions we have across the political spectrum. Let's take a deeper look by analysing an interview where it all comes to the surface. Let's do it really seriously. Hello there you army of 4,240,000 odd miracles. This is a uh, piece of footage that shows the moment that former New York Times journalist Barry Weiss confronted CNN's Brian Stelter when listing examples of why the world has gone mad during Sunday's edition of Reliable Sources, which seems like a misleading title given the nature of our ongoing discourse about these topics. What reliable sources can there be when there are so many financial imperatives at place and a lack of regulation? And by regulation, I don't mean censorship, but I mean regulating the flow of money between big media and big business. That's kind of what I'm uh, implying. Let's have a little look. You write, there are tens of millions of Americans who aren't on the hard left or the hard right who feel the world has gone mad. Hey, I think that as well. I feel that the old political strata are starting to come apart as people recognise that these old and ossified institutions are not capable of and have no interest in representing ordinary people and their stroke our needs. You might not think I'm ordinary because I've got these fancy necklaces and I do this for a living, but believe you me, I was born in very ordinary circumstances and in my heart, this is my affiliation. So. Where does she go with this? So in what ways has the world gone mad? Well, you know, when you have the chief reporter on the beat of COVID for the New York Times talking about how questioning or pursuing the question of the lab leak is racist, the world has gone mad. I always thought the wet market had its own xenophobic underpins. Wet market. And I always felt that that particular piece of reporting bias was to protect corporate and pharmacological interests as opposed to protecting sort of racist narratives. It seems sometimes particular ideas are put forward to censor, control, stymie debate rather than to create some sort of more effective, integrative morality between people. When we're not able to say that Hunter Biden's laptop is a story worth pursuing, the world has gone mad. There mm. are dozens of examples that I could share with, with you and with and your you viewers. And you often say, you say everyone allowed. Everyone sort of knows this. And you say we're not allowed, we're not able. Between... Who's the people stopping the conversation? Who are they? Um, people that work at networks, <laughs> frankly, like the one I'm speaking on right now, who try and claim that, you know... <laughs> I beg your pardon, what exactly are you saying? Now, there's a whole roster of various issues there, many of them by their nature divisive in what are loosely termed the culture wars. Me, where I stand, is outside of it. I feel that people should be able to pursue their lives however they want to, and that there should be a transparency around reporting on a variety of issues. I have no political axe to grind with any side in any particular culture war debate. I'm interested in what this person feels about the conditions she feels she worked under at the New York Times and her comments about media censorship. And it's also surprising there that at reliable sources is so surprising. But I'm a reliable source. It was racist to investigate the lab leak theory. It was, but I mean, who let's said just that take at an CNN. example. But I'm just saying, that when you say allowed, I just think it's a provocative thing you say. You say, you say we're not allowed to talk about these things, but they're all over the internet. Well, what, I can Google them, Brian, I can find them everywhere. I've heard about every story you mentioned. Of course. So I'm just suggesting, of course, people are allowed to cover whatever they want to cover. But you and I both know, and it would be delusional to claim otherwise, that touching your finger to an increasing number of subjects that have been deemed third rail by the mm. mainstream institutions and increasingly by some of the tech companies will lead to reputational damage, perhaps you losing your job, um, your children sometimes being demonized as well. And so what happens is a kind of mm. internal self-censorship. This mm. is something that I saw over and over again when I was at the New York Times. People saying to themselves, you know what, why should I die on that hill? Why should I take the three or four weeks that it takes to smuggle through an op-ed that doesn't suit the conventional narrative? I might as huh. well commission the 5,000th op-ed saying that Donald Trump is a moral monster. What's going on is the transformation of these sense-making institutions of American life. Sense-making institutions of American life, and perhaps the same is true 
everywhere that a particular set of opinions are put forward, either because it suits the economic interests of the powerful or it creates confusion and conflict among what you might loosely term ordinary people. So we become mired in conversations and conflicts that aren't advancing the interests of ordinary people, aren't addressing and remedying inequality among ordinary people, but are creating tensions and difficulties. Cards on the table, I believe in people's freedom to be however they want to be. I believe in people's freedom to have a traditional upbringing or a progressive upbringing or even to mess with how those labels or terms are used. What I don't agree with is the way that big business, government and big media create a set of avenues down which discourse is permitted and huge veils and territories of censorship, prohibition and unnecessary conflict between people whose interests are ultimately aligned. People want to live free lives. People want to be left alone. People want to help one another. People don't want to live tyrannised by their economic penury. It's the news media, it's the publishing houses, it's the Hollywood studios, it's our universities, and they are narrowing in a radical way what's mm. acceptable to say and what isn't. So what Vice is claiming is that within the mainstream media, certain topics and subjects can't be discussed, usually for moral reasons that personally, you know, if you're talking about compassion and kindness, I would agree with, although I would dispute that that is the result. Elsewhere in British media, in The Guardian, Owen Jones, on the subject of hate speech and Violence says, recently the discussion has been derailed by a push to ban anonymous social media accounts, which would stifle free speech and democratic rights. Often when we hear about censorship and control, it's usually for reasons that I think pretty much everyone would agree with. You don't want people being hateful. You don't want bigotry and prejudice. But there's a problem. Possibly the reasons for the censorship that are being offered are not the true reasons that the censorship is being advanced. We must ask, writes Jones, whether strengthening the online safety bill is the right approach. By shifting attention away from extremism towards online anonymity, do we hinder our democracy? There are many legitimate reasons why a citizen may not feel comfortable posting their opinion or sharing information under their own identity. Systems require control, whether you're talking about government systems, corporate systems, or big media or social media systems. By eliminating the possibility of anonymity, you increase more control for centralised power and you diminish the already limited control of ordinary people to publish information and to discuss matters that affects the interests of the powerful. The bill, Owen Jones is writing about a bill being proposed in the UK by a regulatory body called Ofcom, usually used to censor and control media information. The bill would allow Ofcom to punish social networks that fail to remove lawful but harmful content. That's a really peculiar and I would say amorphous piece of language. It's diff lawful but harmful. You know, I'm starting to see the emergence of language around compassion and morality being used to advance tyranny. Are you noticing that as well? This is to be kind. This is because we don't want people to be hurt. There's loads of ways of preventing people being hurt. Let people have control over their own lives. Do something meaningful about inequality across all classes and strata of people, focusing primarily on economic inequality rather than other forms of inequality, whilst those are also important. Economic inequality is probably the biggest vector which will affect negative outcomes in your life, it could be argued. Jones continues, defining abuse is politically subjective. What is seen as accountability by some could be seen as abuse by others. If someone has lost a loved one to government policy, are we now to tell them that their hurt and anger have no place in public discourse? For example, I suppose, as a result of a foreign war. Neutral civility is the preserve of those for whom politics is only ever a game, a career, not the force that shapes their life, sometimes for the worse. And I think that's an important point, that generally speaking, passion, invective and visceral debate come about as a result of inequality, oppression, repression, rage, anger perhaps the only accessible resource of those more primal feelings. If you live in the rarefied professional spaces where discourses are kind of, as Jones points out, a game, you no longer require the splenetic ventations that would be censored under new legislation.
Responding to a despicable attack by hampering scrutiny of politicians undermines our democracy. The problem comes down to the fact that the people making the regulations, the people imposing the censorship, are usually funded by and interconnected with one another. There is no independent body within these systems. It's only by empowering ordinary people to run their own lives, set their own cultures, goals, systems and stratagems that you're going to have anything approaching freedom. As long as these edicts are top-down, centralised ideas, as long as main mainstream media organisations follow the line, toe the line, focus on condemnation of ordinary people and their cultural disparities, then we're going to have conflagration. As long as big tech can select and elect their own governing bodies, we're not going to get anything that impedes their ability to make profit. These machines, in my opinion, whilst they use culture as a veil and a mask, are essentially money-making power machines and will use culture as a veil when it's convenient, will dial censorship up and down as it suits them, will create confrontation if it's expedient and do not care about the ethics and morality that affect ordinary people's lives. Censorship of ordinary people will ultimately be a bad thing and introducing that under the veil of protecting people is pretty nefarious if you ask me. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments below if you're concerned about ongoing censorship. Let me know if you think there's a relationship between censorship online, a place that ordinary people can communicate, and towing the line in mainstream media places. Does this create a hegemonic culture where it's impossible to engage in meaningful discourse? If people are allowed to communicate openly, would we get along better despite the various ways in which we are different? Different, but valuable. Let me know in the comments below. Give this video a like. Subscribe to my channel. If you enjoyed this video, please give this one a little look. And if you want to meditate, why not have a look at this video so you can move yourself forward and let go of some pain there. And please sign up to my mailing list where I'll talk through various techniques to improve and change yourself and your own individual life so we can participate in this change together. Stay free.